Hello, bonjour and ahoy. I'm Roger Hilton, Defense and Security Research Fellow at Globesec, coming to you from Vienna, Austria. Amidst the COVID-19 madness going on, anyone following global affairs could be forgiven for missing some of the big arms control issues coming on. It wasn't so long ago the days of Cold War arms control negotiations between the U.S. and the USSR that resulted in SALT-1, SALT-2, and INF. Now, with renewed technologies and renewed rivalries, arms control is back front and center. With me today to add a little bit of rocket fuel to this discussion is our favorite expert, Dr. Katarzyna Kubiak, arms control and nuclear expert from the European Leadership Network. Katarzyna Jindoble, great to see you. Great to see you. Thank you for the invitation. Well, Katarzyna, thank you so much. We're really, really lucky, uh, you know, to, to get you on camera today. So the big thing is, as we talked about, we referenced the Cold War and the USSR and sort of the big great power rivalries of the past. Why don't you outline to people today why arms control is an important issue that we should be focused on? Yes, yes, it's a, it's a great question. So maybe for, for, for those who need more visual examples of what's going on, uh, two days ago, the so-called doomsday clock has been remained a 100 seconds to midnight. And what this means, uh, you know, on the side of several experts who sit and decide, you know, how many seconds it is to midnight, this is a signal that humanity is closer than ever uh, to a civilization ending nuclear war, be it by design, blunder, or, or miscommunication. Uh, and I'm sure that even for those um, who, you know, feel that this kind of framings are a kind of um, um, angst uh, makers or unnecessary gimmicks, I mean, everybody reads the news and the news are not very uh, uh, not, not, not very uh, positive. So what we see is basically uh, that um, arms control architecture is eroding. Uh, we see that states which possess nuclear weapons are modernizing the arsenals instead of reducing the arsenals. Uh, we see that confrontation becomes the new name of the game. And that unfortunately, human to human um, channels of communication between nuclear decision makers are deteriorating and as such also our mutual understanding of each other. Um, and on top of this multipolarity together with uh, new technologies and new weapon systems is further undermining, uh, you know, the Cold War sense of strategic stability. So what we basically see is an, is an erosion of an architecture which brought us a predictability and some sense of stability. At the same time, we face new challenges and new problems, which we do not really know how to address with the means and tools we've used to. And then the pace of, of the problem solving is running out of steam. Um, so basically, contemporary arms control has to, um, to uh, has to, um, can play um, a role twofold so first yeah, of all in stabilization and sort of it needs to evolve as you're talking about with the pace of technology so basically you know like if the confrontation will be the premise under which we are going to interact with each other in the century basically arms control could be you know a kind of instrument that can make this confrontation uh more safely for everybody more regulated and 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 uh stable and if modernization new technologies new weapon systems military uh, military build-ups uh you know um render limitations obsolete or impossible or difficult, then we need to probably focus on risk reduction uh, in order to stabilize the situation. And obviously we will not be able to do everything at once. Uh, we, we lack the bandwidth to do this. Um, and as such, we probably need to focus on, on those issues which create the most risks um, globally. Um, so what we are looking for currently is, first of all, coming up with new arms control paradigms to tackle the new issues and the manifold of issues. And second, we need to also prior to prioritize our arms control to-do list. So, so this is the space to watch out in the next years. I mean, it's so great you referenced uh, the doomsday clock. I mean, what would Herman Kahn think about the, atomics, uh, the, the atomic bulletin and uh, how that's still today going back to the 60s and 70s is so relevant. No pressure about world destruction, everybody. But Katya, thanks for giving us an outline of how it's looking about the new paradigm and how more importantly, we need to do it step by step as it would be unrealistic to do it in one shot. Obviously the big news that's making headway today 
or this week was uh, the, the new incoming, or excuse me, the President Biden and President uh, Putin of Russia, they extended the new start uh, for five years, which was to be expected. It wasn't sure where it was going to go. So Katya, is this, are we, is this something we should be celebrating that it's been extended for five years or are we just kicking up another problem down the road and saying we're going to deal with it later? Yeah, I think it's interesting that you reference this step by step because in general, individual arms control agreements and instruments are never designed to tackle, you know, and to solve all problems at all times uh, in the complexity and the entirety. And the same goes for New START. I mean, New START is no different here. Um, but at the same time, I will also caution from writing it off as uh, unimportant because mm-hmm. to the contrary. Um, so New START is the last... Uh, nuclear arms control treaty governing strategic forces between uh, the United States and Russia. Uh, It limits the amount of uh, warheads and delivery systems Washington and Moscow can deploy. Mm -hmm. Um, It has some specific um, um, channels of communication between Moscow and Washington, which allow diplomats from both sides to sit down and address the concern uh, regarding uh, the arsenal modernizations, for example, um, including some of Russia's new uh, weapon systems. Um, the treaty's verification regime um, allows for unprecedented transparency, which supports predictability. And I feel there is also a very important, sometimes forgotten point, especially from the perspective of Europe. So when you start uh, was being ratified, the U.S. Senate uh, kind of committed the American president to engage with Russia in order to um, uh, look for verifiable uh, reductions of especially nuclear weapons deployed here in Europe. Um, So far, unfortunately, there were no coherent strategies on how to approach this issue. Uh, But for those on both sides of the Atlantic who feel that you know, nuclear restraint, especially on nuclear weapons here in Europe, is important. New START kind of remains a, a hook uh, to request further action from the American uh, um, presidency. Um, at the same time, I, I would definitely argue that New START is not a remedy for all nuclear relevant or related problems. It's not a magic pill, uh, but we rather need to see its extension as a kind of allowing ourselves um, more breathing space to develop these new initiatives and think about new paradigms uh, for arms control in an ever-changing geopolitical and technological environment. So, yes, we need new start, and it's true, we also need to dig further. Mm -hmm. And there is a bunch of topics, you know, to explore, starting from obviously reducing numbers, uh, reducing uh, alert status of nuclear weapons, reducing risks related to miscalculation, miscommunication, and misperception, uh, reducing the risk of accidents and incidents, um, strengthening communication channels, including new technologies or uh, non-strategic nuclear weapons, so those weapons which, which are deployed here in Europe. Uh, well, I mean, Katya, I think it's great that you started off by saying we're sort of in the middle ground where this is a great sort of an area for zone of possible agreement or a first step in a uh, sort of in the confidence building measure, right? Because as we determined earlier, this is a little bit of breathing room and who knows where we can go with a little bit of momentum. I thought something that stood out in your comment was the word magic pill. And now we are actually going to try to make a little bit of our own magic. The holy grail right now of arms control is how do we bring China into current agree- current agreements or how do we incentivize them to come into new ones? So Katya, what do you make of this concern from Washington's perspective about the future of arms control having to be dependent on China joining them? Yeah, I, I first of all would like to basically refer to um, to the way you have asked this question, because um, our audience may not be aware of this. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so there are five nuclear weapon states which are legally committed to uh, nuclear disarmament. And uh, for the sake of transparency, it's probably important to set the record straight. Um, it's true that the United States, and especially uh, the United States under President Donald Trump, were pressing China to enter you know, arms control conversations. But it's also true that in parallel, Russia is also calling to include uh, Great Britain and France into this conversation. So China is only uh, basically one um, uh, one partner who possibly could could be on the bigger uh, on the extended table. But there is definitely a merit uh, to why we focus on China, which is that uh, Great Britain and France in in, in 
in in um, in the in the past basically already reduced the sizes uh, of the arsenals, and this is not the case with China, which is rather trending towards uh, growing its its Actually. arsenal. Exactly. I'm obviously not an expert on China, so a lot of what you will hear is a kind of um, information I could gather from my uh, colleagues who are more knowledgeable, like Tong Zhao from Carnegie, for example. And, and I found it very interesting what um, how he's framing the interest why China probably at one point will join arms control. And there, he basically mentions like three points. So. Um, you know, first of all, major power competition will remain, and it's obviously in China's interest to kind of uh, keep it controlled and somehow regulate it. Um, then it's really interesting because China for a very long time was kind of uh, benefiting from American Russian arms control system, um, from the um, Russian American arms control architecture, which basically uh, stabilized the Chinese neighborhood. Mm -hmm. This architecture that almost doesn't exist anymore, which means that China out. currently also faces more um, security questions and challenges to itself. And then obviously the domestic politics issue, which is, you know, China has had a pretty big uh, defense and security expenses for the past years, mm -hmm. which they may have a problem in keeping at the same level because of other key socioeconomic needs. Mm -hmm. um, so this is what probably at one point will bring China towards the table. So it's rather still not the if, but as you have asked rightly, how, you know, can we interest China into sitting at the table? And I feel that looking at how uh, President Trump's administration tried to kind of coerce China into arms control um, discussions, this is not the way which kind of resonated uh, with Chinese um, um, decision makers. And we probably need to try to frame it as a kind of attempt to uh, manage this potentially um, troubling confrontation. And I see at least two triggers or kind of doors and and at least one forum where this could be possible so in terms of you know approach obviously the technical capability driven approach is to look um you know to compare different arsenal sizes and it doesn't need to be nuclear because as we know there is a huge discrepancy Security. between nuclear arsenals of russia and the united states and china uh, but we can look at other uh, arsenals and other capabilities like the delivery system and, you know, trying to equalize the numbers and then probably reducing them. So this would be one approach. And the other approach uh, is a kind of backdoor approach, if you want so. Uh, we know that everybody likes to enter uh, arms control or any kind of negotiations from a position of strength. And if we think about China, its strength is definitely in part of uh, developing new technologies, for example, quantum, for example, hypersonic weapons, you know, it has a kind of upper hand on, on some of these. Um, so it may be possible to, for example, um, invite China and others to start discussing nuclear risk, but from the perspective of these new technologies, rather than from the perspective of um, nuclear arsenals themselves. And I feel that one format which is uh, particularly good for this is definitely the P5, where all the nuclear weapon states, all the official nuclear weapon states, uh, sit together in, in a kind of trust, trusting environment, uh, can discuss ways uh, for strategic risk reduction, uh, which they are doing, which we should support them to do further. Uh, but, you know, one of the forum non-nuclear weapon states can use to make more pressure on or to put more incentive um, to the nuclear weapon states holder is definitely the NPT review conference uh, where we can basically make uh, make more visual and, and, and more vivid, you know, the need uh, for this type of conversation going on, including China and other nuclear weapon possessing states. Uh, well, Katarzyna, I, couldn't, I can't help but think you provided such a comprehensive background. You've introduced a lot of new ideas. So I think it's fair to say that this conversation is really just getting started. I mean, we started here with uh, President Putin and President Biden, but who knows, in, in two years' time when we're having the same conversation, we might be talking about where China sits on it. Katia, thank you so much for sharing your expertise and your insight. Uh, I know I've taken a lot away from the conversation, uh, and I can't wait to sort of revisit the issue later down the road uh, when something uh, big is in the headlines about it. So all the best from Vienna. I look forward to staying in contact with you. Roger, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Ciao. Have a great day. Ciao. Bye.